our moderator for today's session, Margie Brand, uh, Executive Director of the Vicara Institute. Over to you, Margie. Great, thank you and welcome everyone. Today we're gonna to talk about market systems resilience and in a moment we'll be uh, meeting uh, some of the team um, that is gonna be sharing on some of the global case studies uh, that are going to be discussed. Um, to start us off, I really wanted to recognize that unfortunately many parts of our world today are, are challenged by local or larger scale conflict. We've got recurrent natural disasters such as seasonal flooding and drought. We've got unexpected natural disasters. There might be typhoons, earthquakes, many others, maybe health outbreaks, pandemics, which communities uh, within communities or, or maybe even across the globe. Maybe health outbreaks among livestock, pest outbreaks, plagues, or even fluctuating market conditions that might throw economies into disarray. And part of what we're looking at here is how do communities cope? What do they do to reactively recover from a shock or long-term stress? Or how do they rebuild better than before? How are they able to work together to be more proactive in preparing for shocks before they actually arrive. So in doing this, we need to understand more about what are the risks communities are facing? How are communities coping? And how do they cope better? As well as where do we as the development community, uh, how are we able to support them? And in trying to understand this and understanding resiliency more, we're wanting to understand more about the resiliency of households, the resiliency of communities, the resiliency of enterprises within those communities, but now more than ever, the resiliency of the wider system in which those communities find themselves. Now, recognizing that much has been done to understand and support resilience at the household level for many decades, but more recently, there's been an increased focus on understanding and being able to strengthen resilience at more of an overall systems level. Now, we've seen a lot in terms of publishing frameworks, briefs, case studies, assessments, and more and more programs are starting to come on board to address resilience at the market systems level directly. Let's look at some examples. Um, we're going to see on the slide just some of the resources that, are, that, are, um, that we've been working on in recent times. So soon when we look at the slide, we'll see an example of a state of the sector map. Let's see if Jenny is going to bring that up for us. Or maybe I'll just talk through those, even if they're not on our, our screen. Um, well, we've we've seen a number of resources come into play, and um, the, one of those is a MSR, a Market Systems Resilience State of the Field Map. This was supported through USAID by the Markets and Partnership Program. Um, and it's looking at who's doing what out there, which programs are focusing more on market systems resilience. And we're going to be sharing links as various speakers are talking about resources in the chat. So do access them there and also feel free to put your own links to other resources. This really is a sharing session today. Um, so there's a state of the field map which talks about who's doing what in which programs and also has contact details for people in those programs. So you can connect with each other around assessments and studies that are being done, et cetera. Um, another key resource in this area, if we look at the next slide, is around uh, various frameworks and briefs and case studies that have been developed. This is a particular series on market systems resilience, a brief and case study supported by USAID, um, and there are more being added. The next one will focus specifically on bringing in a resilience lens to support household resilience. Next, we'll look at um, some of the frameworks that have been developed. This is a USAID market systems resilience framework for measurement. There are other frameworks, market systems resilience through USAID and other donors. Um, next, there is also a cartoon based learning tool, which we've been working on directly available in English, French and Spanish. Those links should be going into the chat um, as we're speaking um, on various where you can access those. Um, and another, I think, resource that we'll mention next is the, um, a series of case studies. This was focused on market systems resilience at, in Nepal um, and a series of assessments that have been done. But please do feel free to share your other resources too. So leaving the slides for a moment, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that market systems can play a role 
um, in supporting communities in different ways, you know, by bolstering communities' resilience capacities in ways that help communities to weather shocks and stresses more effectively. And we're going to look at some of examples from some of those today. I mean, many market systems provide products and services, technologies, or expertise that become really critical in supporting communities to protect, preserve, or recover from a shock or stress. And market systems can also provide ways that households can access cash that they need by supplying crops, animals, other products, or labor that are essential in helping um, communities and households actually manage um, shocks and stresses. They might be um, areas such as pre existing housing and construction services or healthcare services, irrigation, agricultural inputs, veterinary services, insurance, information services that all become critical to minimize loss during a shock or stress. What we're also going to be looking at is how does the system itself play more of a role? So communities are not left to be able to cope with something on their own, but rather that they can get support from other communities outside. And that might be through social safety nets provided by other spaces or by um, different areas that different market actors are providing. So let's have a look at who we are going to be hearing from today. We've got a an excellent roundup of expertise from different parts of the world. We've got a slide that's going to come on in a moment to show us who's actually um, on this panel today. We've got uh, folks from ACI Voca joining us, um, uh, focusing specifically on their Honduras program and then bringing up examples from elsewhere. Um, and that is Sue Chavez and Hayden Aronson from ACI Voca. We've got folks from Vol um, and focusing specifically on their Latin American Caribbean a region, um, also from Mercy Corps, um, and I'm focusing on their uh, representatives from Nigeria as well as from Ethiopia. I'll be introducing them more specifically as we proceed. But to start us off, we're going to be hearing uh, from Sue Chavez, who's with ACI Bocas in Honduras with the USA Transforming Market Systems activity. And when we hear Sue speaking, what I think is useful is to recognize that she's going to be speaking about looking at resilience at a national and sector level. And she's also going to talk about building resilience capacities across the system, looking at things such as improved learning across the system, building adaptive capacity of the system so that the system is no longer reactively absorbing shocks, but more proactively preparing um, despite shocks in order to stay competitive. So, Sue, over to you. Thank you, Margie, and thank you all for joining us today. Before presenting the case, I would like to talk a little bit about who we are. So maybe Jenny can help us with the next slide, please. Our activity, Transforming Market Systems, works on deep-rooted systemic changes that catalyze long-term broad-based economic growth to provide more, better, and inclusive jobs to reduce incentives to migrate. In the next slide, you will see how our tourism component seeks three systemic change objectives. Public and private collaboration to market destinations, improved destinations offer, and differentiation and specialization of tourism products. So enough about who we are. Now let's talk about Honduras in the past years. In the next slide, I will show you a little bit about the state of tourism. We all know that tourism has been hit hard by COVID-19. However, Honduran tourism has weathered not only this, but several crises, including hurricanes, travel advisory warnings, and overall politi in political instability showing resilience and the ability to bounce back from shocks. In 2019, Honduras suffered from a poor international reputation and lack of government support for tourism promotion. And while other countries in Central America enjoyed a nearly 34% increase in tourism flows in the past decade, Honduras increased only 5% over the same period. However, a year later in 2020, when the first airports in Asia and Europe were closed, TMS partnered the National Chamber of Tourism, was ready and immediately deployed a toolbox of communication protocols as a proactive response to COVID-19. 
and advocated for relief measures which benefit more than 5,000 employees from more than 1,000 companies in 17 regions. And by 2021, Honduras is among the first countries to attain a full recovery of its international visitors. This case study will share how the tourism sector and TMS work to mobilize at a national level to develop a functional framework for crisis and transform itself to better manage future risk by supporting market systems to self-organize, take planning decisions, and develop risk mitigating strategies. So we can increase market system resilience to better manage risk at a sector level, to absorb, adapt, and even transform in the face of shocks that threaten to roll back development progress. Now, I would like to talk about how we build resilience in tourism. Well, resilience building for the tourism sector began before COVID when our local stakeholders through TMS co-creation planning for the country tourism strategy realized that they could not rely only on the government to mitigate the image crisis. Tourism needed to retain its international visitor regardless of all the negative news published by the media about insecurity or social unrest. Worldwide, tourism is increasingly becoming a major source of growth and employment, especially in developing countries. In Honduras, every dollar in tourism spending generates 54 cents in sales for food and agriculture. Through our first market system assessment in 2019, we gathered tourism associations and local chambers and understood that the perception of Honduras as an unsafe destination was clearly a main underlying costs of Honduras underperforming in foreign tourist arrivals. In our workshops with local tourism enterprises, stakeholders recognized that they had an active role in changing the international perceptions of the country, and that by effectively communicating accurate information to wholesalers and travelers in main outbound markets and providing this information in a timely manner, they could change the media narrative and demonstrate, for example, that tourism destinations are safe spaces for travelers and that these guidelines could be applied during any type of crisis. To support this adaptation, our project facilitated technical assistance to 16 regional tourism chambers and five national tourism associations for the co-creation of a crisis communication toolkit based on the UNWTO principle, as well as the formation of local crisis committees that proved to be critical during the pandemic. This toolkit included guidelines for effective and responsible crisis communication and messaging, templates for press releases to approach key audiences, responsibilities and procedures during a crisis, preparedness in policies, spokesperson and media training, and monitoring. This resulted in improved governance, and by 2020, Honduras private sector and high-level government authorities had put in place a series of early measures for crisis communication. Information was orderly managed as team disseminated relevant data to all tourism enterprises within the first week of borders closing. The sector capacity to self-organize also played a critical role in building resilience. Traditionally, in Honduras, tourism had not had the same level of representation in public policy as other sectors. There is a pecking order in which the preferred sectors or the ones with big companies are more likely to receive resources for relief and recovery. Therefore, when Congress passed the first relief package for COVID-19, it did not have specific provisions for the recovery of the industry. However, because a stakeholder had prepared, they mobilized immediately in response, creating the Tourism Emergency Table, a first national public-private working space with representation of 18 major national tourism destinations that TMS co-host. Yet, this relief package and tools needed to be effectively distributed among tourism suppliers, and there's where connectivity to markets and support services played a critical role in recovery. While the agriculture sector received more than $100 million in disbursements, banks spent effectively little in tourism credits, and enterprises needed to make new investments to resume services. So this led again to a reorganization stage, where TMS funded local financial clinics for tourism MSMEs in main tourism destinations. These clinics were organized by local chambers and generated enough data and evidence to catalyze the creation of guarantee funds a special relief products, and later the first credit union for tourism as a way to mitigate over-dependence on the formal banking system. 
It was evident that as the COVID crisis continued without an end in sight, a new strategy was needed, but there was absence of data to support decision making. TMS advocate with the National Chamber of Tourism for the monitoring of the economic impacts of the crisis, gathering data on occupancy levels and conducting several more in-depth studies with support from our monitoring specialists and a local university. Based on these findings, the Chamber identified three priority areas for long-term action and response. First, there was access to credit. Tourism enterprises needed fresh operating resources, reading, renegotiate their current debt and make investment on biosecurity measures to resume services. Second, reopening planning, which included implementation of biosecurity protocols and product improvements to meet the new travelers' needs. And last, marketing and promotion. This involved forecasting future demand patterns and designing a commercialization strategy for priority markets. With these principles, TMS supported the National Emergency Table to elaborate a reactivation plan, which was consulted with all the presidents of tourism associations and local chambers, prepared a time timeline and specific actions to resume services so that once travel restrictions were lifted, promotional campaigns and tour distribution could start. Through this plan, the sector was able to develop and present to the government economic economic cabinet, real-time data on the disproportionate effects of COVID-19 on tourism, which led to an amendment of the relief package with the special provisions for tourism, helping enterprises rehire or maintain at least 2,000 employees. But this was, not, this was not the only adaptation necessary. TMS also supported other identified needs of the tourism enterprises with workforce training and the creation of tools such as biosecurity manuals, social media marketing, and product development checklists for tourism MSMEs to adapt to the new reality and further endorse learning and adaptation during COVID-19. The digital dissemination of trainings with international media partners such as Expedia serve to share best practices on digital marketing and to accelerate e-commerce solutions, touchless technologies, digital marketing, and product diversification among the sectors most affected by restricted circulation. This turnover showed a shift within the tourism private sector into proactively building capacity to organize, advocate, and coordinate themselves considering that all the planning and execution was led by the local chamber and the tourism technical and their tourism technical staff, with TMS having only three tourism specialists following up on these actions. Finally, it came the moment to restart tourism and invest in system attractors to restore confidence and stimulate visitors' arrival. The ability to understand market trends and adapt promotion and product offer accordingly is an essential element in tourism survival. Through a seed capital program, TMS and the Chamber of Tourism invested in over 15 experiences and launched a commercialization and PR program co-financed by the Tourism Institute to promote Honduras' recently gained safe travel seal from the World Travel and Tourism Council and position the country internationally for leisure travel. This effort got Honduras featured in major publications such as the New York Times and Connas Traveler. So what lessons did we learn? First, the need for a functional framework so market actors can be prepared and provide coordinated and timely responses. Second, self-organization, the ability of public and private actors to create working spaces and join plans to advocate for the tourism sector. And last, connectivity to markets and support services the pandemic labor issues that had plagued the tourism sector before, such as reluctance for them from the financial sector to support credits. So planning, monitoring, and adjustment of activities is critical for recovery. And at the end, why is all this relevant? In tourism, resilience and sustainable growth are key to sustain thousands of jobs and small enterprises in a country with one of the highest rates of economically motivated out migration. We must keep working on more transformative and structural changes in advance to the next inevitable crisis. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Sue. And I think what was particularly 
um, impactful year is looking at how to make communities and yeah, the whole country or a sector more resilient by supporting an organized response um, to decision making and risk management. We heard you speak about self organization and avoiding fragmented responses and facilitating kind of this coordinated response at a national level. You mentioned access to finance, marketing, promotional facilities to support future strategies, digitization. You spoke about diversification, not only of products, but also of business strategies and having the private sector look at how do they self organize and collaborate to plan for the next stage and for future um, challenges that might exist. You also spoke about information coming in quickly so the private sector could roll out rapidly once context change and but also the governance of the sector overall to strategize to respond in an organized way both at the public and private space working together you also mentioned interestingly systems attractors being put in place to draw in new entrants and customers so let's look at a little bit of a different perspective now let's move to year from goal who's been doing so much work in this resilience space I wanted to introduce Bernard McCall, who's Deputy Director for Program Design and Innovation within the Latin and, America, Latin and Caribbean uh, regional um, level. And also his uh, counterpart, Gabriela um, Caceres, who's the Resilient Unit Manager for Resilience and Innovation within their Learning Hub. And um, uh, over to you, Bernard and Gabriela. Thank you, Margie, and uh, just to say we're, we're very glad to present to you today case studies in local systems approach from Goals International Programs on transforming crisis to resilience in fragile and conflict affected contexts. And that, that will be a, a key focus of the case studies that we're going to present uh, fragile and conflict affected contexts. And so we want to emphasize uh, three lessons at the outset that, that we would uh, highlight. Um, one is that there, there's an assumption that market system resilience, which we equate to a local systems approach, is either not feasible or not relevant in fragile and conflict affected contexts. And, and we would challenge that and argue that it, it is important to apply market system resilience in these contexts if they are to move beyond crisis. The second key lesson that we would highlight is that the, the process of stabilizing local systems needs to be uh, that are understood and could be a key strategy in localization in responding to a uh, crisis. And then the third lesson is applying uh, market system resilience will enable leveraging of local assets and capacities and, and building uh, local assets and, and capacities as well. So I wanna, what I want to show you on- um, As you continue, uh, do you wanna put your camera on so we can see you as you're presenting? Oh, apologies, I thought the camera was on. Uh, so what, what I want to present to you next very, very briefly um, is to put in, in the context the two case studies that we'll present today. Um, Gold firmly believes that the only way to move uh, crisis affected populations beyond crisis towards resilience is by protecting, stabilizing and strengthening local systems. Localization is not just about local actors, it's about uh, local systems and building the capacity of local actors based on their role within local systems. So this graphic very briefly sets out a trajectory across five levels from crisis to resilience, including a level one where the context is in, in collapse and local systems are in collapse, level two where it's survival with support, level three local capacity for survival, level four is fragile capacities to, to thrive, and level five is a uh, high capacity to thrive and you're moving towards resilience at that end of the scale. It's important to recognize that the potential impact of different risk scenarios uh, will vary and crisis affected populations can move up or down uh, levels depending on the impact of crises and the progress that's been made in building resilience. So engagement in local systems is related to the crisis level of the context along the trajectory. For example, in level one, the focus is more on meeting immediate needs um, and may include uh, direct actions to stabilize local systems, whereas level four, the emphasis is more on facilitating local system strengthening with permanent actors. And as populations progress along this trajectory, shocks and stresses will occur and the functioning of local systems will dictate whether affected populations fall deeper into crisis or, or towards resilience. So today we want to present one case study uh, from a level one, which is outside the, the LAC region in Syria, and one case study from a level two context. 
So the first case study um, is an intervention over the past 10 years by goal to stabilize the water supply system in northwest Syria. And so the war in Syria has been ongoing, as everybody knows, for over a decade since 2011, following the Arab Springs uprising. Uh, over the course of the 11 years of the war, more than 500,000 people have lost their lives, including over 22,000 children. 7.6 million people have been internally displaced and 5 million people have fled the country as refugees. So Gaul's response to the humanitarian crisis uh, is focused in northwest Syria, in the northwest region of the country where almost 3 million people are, are located in Aleppo and Idlib provinces. Most local systems for a normal functioning society have collapsed over the course of the war. Uh, one of the kind of key decisions that Gaul made early on was to decide to apply a local systems approach to respond to the potable water needs of the affected populations. And when the war left, no state institution uh, capable of managing the water supply network, Gold stepped in to carry out uh, functions of, of that uh, local system um, in order to prevent the system from collapsing. Um, and Goal has worked to stabilize the system, enabling 800,000 people in extremely fragile and conflict-affected contexts to access potable water each day uh, over the past 10 years. So next, I'd like to just briefly describe some of the practical actions that have been done to stabilize this critical local system, um, uh, in the water supply system in northwest Syria. Uh, the full description of this uh, case study is available, uh, is documented in a peer-reviewed research article published in the Progress and Disaster Science Journal uh, last year and can be accessed through the, the QR code shown there. Uh, the intervention strategy has four interrelated pillars, including systems approach, localization, adaptive management, and an assurance framework. In relation to systems approach to stabilize the system, the intervention has included strategic investment projects uh, for the rehabilitation of pipelines, pumping stations, power generation, and other key infrastructure. Goal has supported the continued employment of 300 uh, water maintenance staff across four municipal water units. Goal has provided uh, fuel for the operation of pumping stations and paid for staff salaries. Uh, and Goal has provided capacity building in, in a range of areas over the last decade um, to improve the, the performance and operation of the system in a very fragile context. Adaptive management uh, has been essential to constantly monitor the evolution of the conflict uh, and develop contingency plans which were in place for identified risk scenarios and required shifting in our support to the system at various different times. Uh, also, the water supply system itself <clears throat> has adapted over the years to increase its capacity uh, and reach to meet the shifting needs of populations displaced into northwest Syria and, and within that region. Uh, numerous measures are included to operationalize an assurance framework in a context where levels of trust among different stakeholders is often absent. Strict adherence to humanitarian principles uh, was essential. Uh, a range of other measures within an assurance framework include targeting and verification of targeting, uh, management of the risk of aid di diversion, and a whole range of other measures to operationalize uh, an assurance framework. In addition, a community feedback mechanism was introduced into the operation of the water supply system to improve, improve service uh, quality uh, for and accountability to users, and a safeguarding mechanism was, was rolled out. There are a number of challenges to localization, but ultimately the aim of our work is to fully hand over the system to permanent actors. A lot of work has been done to connect the cross-border electrical supply system from Turkey, prioritizing critical infrastructure such as water pumps and hospitals. In addition, work is ongoing over a number of years um, to develop a cost recovery model that can be operationalized by local actors uh, and reduce and eventually eliminate the dependence on external aid. So a key lesson in this case study is that in some circumstances, particularly in very fragile and conflict-affected contexts, it may be relevant for temporary actors to carry out permanent roles in a system to prevent that system from collapse and ensure that every effort has been, been made to hand over to the appropriate local actors when the opportunity uh, arises to do that. And stabilizing the system has reduced the impact of the conflict and will accelerate the transition to resilience. So next, I want to pass over to Gabriela Caceres, who will present a case study from uh, Latin America region.
Yes, hello everyone. So this case study is about systems approach to <clears throat> urban resilience in fragile and conflict affected context. Uh, we are transforming into an urban society. One million people are living in informal settlements. The problem is that this is happening rapidly and is exceeding the capacity of local systems to address demand, which is leading to social exclusion and disaster vulnerability. And this is exactly what is happening in the cities where Goal uh, is working currently in Colombia, Haiti, Freetown in Sierra Leone, and particularly in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, where this case study takes place. You might be wondering why consider these sediments as fragile and conflict affected context. Well, informal and precarious um, urban sediments with territorial uh, gangs, like the case of Tegucigalpa, and other locations around the world, my experience fragility via informality and conflict via gang violence, for example. So more about this can be found in a recent publication we have just uh, made with UCL, Rent Corporation and Harvard Humanitarian Institute. You can see the QR code to access and learn more about that. So if we see the next slide, um, crises occur when local systems are collapsing so building resilience implies a local systems approach. Um, as you can see on your screen, the first thing Gold did um, was trans uh, to transform this urban crisis into resilience was identifying and selecting the most critical systems for disaster resilience in target neighborhoods. In this case study, basic food supply system, uh, provision and maintenance of water services, early warning and response system were identified as one of the most critical. And this process was informed by a resilience assessment made at community and systems level using goal uh, tools, RT toolkit and the r approach, among other, other tools and approaches. Secondly, uh, to stabilize, stabilize these local system, goal dedicated time and resources in mapping, understanding these systems. And although this system were critical for disaster resilience, we found that these systems were fragile. Why? In terms of connectivity, connectivity was very low among the system actors. These, and additionally, these systems were disconnected from neighborhoods or were not performing well in, in, even in normal times, and their governance and participation levels were low. Um, this all this experience can have has been documented by goal and global communities in the resilient and inclusive neighborhood approach Rena that you can see on your screen and soon will be published by goal and global communities. Now let's see and focus on the provision and maintenance of water services. So in this slide you can see a simplified representation of the system in urban sediment where. The service is mainly provided, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, by water management committees. The application of a systems approach allowed us to understand the different actors involved, their role, their capacities, but most importantly, it allowed us to see that the system was closely related to another critical uh, system for disaster resilience, the provision and maintenance of drainage. However, if you see on your screen, no actor had the mandate or was responsible for it, and there was no funding model for provision and maintenance of drainage. In this slide, you can see the various stresses between uh, the system actors, including easily you can see the limited uh, funding, and there was no also funding model, and, and this connection between the technical actors providing technical support to the local government or water management in terms of disaster risk planning, and, and, and construction of this kind of, of drainages. So this systemic gap in disaster prone areas in these sediments was increasing the risk of landslide flooding, water and vector borne diseases. So in response to this, Goal facilitated a systemic change by integrating the provision and maintenance of drainage as part of the water management committee's role to do so, a business, mo a business model was developed and to ensure its success, water management companies were linked to local actors who strengthened their operational capacities. Also, a social and behavior change campaign was developed to promote on-time uh, water service payment to reduce arrears in payments and to increase water management committees' capacity to invest in piping and maintenance uh, of drainages. 
Finally, this construction, the, the construction of drainage was based on disaster risk planning, a process uh, that was being led by the local government, academia, and other local actors. This experience was replicated by a local actor in other neighborhoods in Tegucigalpa. Um, and, and we've learned through this process that without a systemic approach, even if a large investment in um, drainage provision and mine maintenance have been made, this never um, have been sustainable and scalable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bernard and um, Gabriella. A lot is coming through in what you're speaking. I mean, we're hearing you talk a little bit about um, uh, building capacity of local actors and local systems, depending on the local context that they're in, to start stabilizing that system and then strengthen the system. And you spoke a lot about engagement in local systems, depending on the crisis level. And, you know, thank you for those examples on the acute crisis level in Syria and working to adapt the water system or the protracted crisis in Honduras and, and working in the urban system. We have an interesting question that's come up from Alison Hamburger from Mercy Corps, um, who really values this kind of framework about which stage of crisis they're in. And, and Alison would love to hear from Goal, you know, how do you think about programming contexts where you've got these different levels in your framework that are potentially are kind of happening at the same time. So maybe shocks can be affecting one location, one level of actors more or less than others, but that they're also happening at a similar time. Goal, any, any response from you at this stage? Yeah, I think what's, what's been very relevant for Goal in this is, is really understanding the context and identify what, what are the critical local systems that will help crisis affected populations move towards resilience. And I, I think that's a key operational decision to design and frame an intervention is understand which are the critical local systems, how are they functioning, how do you best engage uh, to, to build its, its resilience. Um, and that, that's, that's an important kind of key engagement uh, decision. Um, you know, one context may be uh, very fragile to a particular risk scenario and resilient to another. So it's, it's very important to really understand the context and the potential risk scenarios in selecting critical systems to, to engage in. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for reinforcing kind of that that context, the nature of the context that's so critical. Let's move to hearing a little bit from Mercy Corps experience. And we're going to be hearing from um, Dan, Hund ha Dan Hudner, who's the senior Re researcher for resilience and market systems at Mercy Corps. And along with his colleagues, um, John Ranchkara, who is the deputy chief of party in Nigeria for the rural resilience activity that's taking place in Northeast Nigeria. And also from Sanbeto Funte, who's um, the team lead in Ethiopia um, for the REPA program. Um, and uh, let's hear a little bit about focusing on sort of the multiple contexts where resilience can be integrated and also within various levels of the program cycle. Uh, so over to you, Mercy Call. Thank you very much, Margie. Um, and thank you, Market Links, for, for holding this webinar. Uh, so I'll just provide a, a quick framing on Mercy Corps' use of market systems of resilience thinking, and as Margie said, when and how it's incorporated into programming, and then turn it over to my colleagues. Um, so as many of you know, Mercy Corps has a long history of applying both market systems development and resilience approaches in fragile and conflict-affected areas. And historically, we'd, we'd originally viewed market systems primarily as a source of resilience for households. Um, but we've become increasingly interested in building the resilience of the systems themselves in order to sustainably provide that support to households. So we've been very pleased to engage with and, and learn from the growing enthusiasm um, with, with donors and with our, uh, our partner organizations on this call. Uh, the two examples we have today, first, uh, in Northeast Nigeria, as Margie said, we have the Rural Resilience Activity, or RRA, which provides an interesting example of a program that was operating in a very information-scarce environment, uh, but with the explicit goal of incorporating market systems of resilience for households. So RRA um, has applied a heavier and more exploratory uh, analysis of market systems resilience, beginning from an adaptation of USAID's framework to understand which market functions are most vulnerable uh, and shock affected, and then which capacities 
are most critical for them to continue providing their functionality to households despite those shocks and stresses. And then we'll turn over to uh, the Resilience and Pastoralist Areas Program, or RIPA, in Ethiopia. Uh, and RIPA provides a, a, a contrast in that it builds off a longer line of programming. It's uh, the successor most recently to the Prime program there. So uh, Prime and, and then RIPA were able to essentially identify firsthand and, and witness the shocks and stresses that are affecting the market system and are then passed on to households. Um, and they were able to essentially apply adaptive management principles to respond to those shocks and stresses, very focused specifically on bolstering the market functions that were both critical to households, but again, also more fragile and more affected by shocks and stresses, uh, particularly drought and price fluctuations. And they're, they've since built out their measurement programs um, to, to kind of adapt and, and bolster their ability to implement market systems resilience interventions. With that, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody from wherever you are. <clears throat> I am going to speak a little bit on the experience of uh, rural resilience activity and how we've applied market systems uh, resilience into our interventions. First, we considered uh, five uh, capacities uh, that could be market governance, connectivity, diversity, and decision making as well as inclusion. Now, uh, based on uh, the data that we collected, we began to realize that perhaps uh, in our context, uh, you know, market governance as well as connectivity were some of the issues that were tending to pop out. So we went into uh, interrogating the data a little bit in order to contextualize our description or our definition of how we would, uh, you know, consider some of these capacities. So we kind of, uh, you know, uh, defined uh, each of these capacities based on the context in which we are operating. And then we went further to uh, kind of uh, look at what is the contribution for each of these capacities to market systems resilience for Northeast Nigeria. And based on, again, the data that we had been seeing, we, uh, you know, developed some kind of working hypothesis. And for connectivity, for example, we were keen to see that if we strengthen the links and also, you know, strengthen the social capital between the various market players, uh, we would make Northeast Nigeria, uh, you know, uh, market uh, systems resilient. So again, based on that, we kept uh, monitoring uh, over time continuously to see what are the issues that are evolving, what is data telling us over time, are there issues of governance uh, mechanisms that tend to change uh, with new uh, shocks and new stress that happen in the region, how are the various uh, you know network uh, evolving among the various market players because, like I said, connectivity as well as market systems governance uh, tend to be extremely vital. Uh, resilience capacities for our context. And again, uh, with these three thinking, we then come up uh, in, in, in a form of uh, developing our objective for change. So the objective for change for these two resilience capacities are the things that now help us to really interrogate and, and think clearly on our business models and business cases that we develop for uh, our interventions in order to strengthen uh, the various resilience capacities. Let me give you an example of, of how we have done that. Uh, if we considered, uh, you know, uh, situations like uh, at Northeast where market governance tend to change quite a lot, uh, either based on the political economy or based on the crisis that we are going through, uh, you know, uh, this tends to drive the cost of certain things, cost of doing business, cost of uh, uh, getting some essential agricultural uh, commodities like agricultural inputs, et cetera, et cetera. So again, if you uh, also uh, consider some of the challenges that we are, that we are experiencing in the region today, uh, driven by increase in, 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 in food prices, driven by increase in fuel, and also the cost of fertilizers, these tend to again bring uh, additional problems to the market because uh, you know, uh, stakeholders tend to, stakeholders tend to uh, be concerned on how do we really, really uh, you know, get some of these uh, commodities at the hands of the farmers 
at the price that they can afford. So we, as an activity, begin to uh, go after, after, we begin to work with business member organizations. We begin to uh, look at the existing market players and say, okay, how do we strengthen their capacities in order to engage the government probably uh, in a way that uh, 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 improves the way uh, you know, governance is, is uh, structured. I mean, governance is, uh, is uh, market systems, market governance, for example, is, uh... are you able to hear me? Okay. We so we begin ready. to, thank you. We begin to look at the business member organizations and say, okay, look, how do we strengthen the various uh, capacities of the business member organizations to engage government either in advocacy or even more, uh, go after self-regulation. And once we have, uh, we, have, we have done that, we also begin to look at the various, uh, you know, market actor associations and say, okay, look, how do we strengthen the capacities of the various market players in order to either, you know, uh, engage, uh, you know, engage uh, within a particular sector or within a cluster in a way that improves the connectivity and so on and so forth. Now, once we did that, we then move into uh, the process of uh, uh, beginning to see what kind of data do we monitor? How do we uh, then track the changes in the market, uh, you know, in the governance mechanism? How do we, uh, you know, uh, monitor and, and measure the quality and strength of relationships between the various market players? This is kind of the chronological processes that we actually use uh, in, in order to strengthen the market systems resilience. I've been very particular about the two uh, critical capacity issues that we see in Northeastern Nigeria. But we don't stop there. We actually look at all the other capacities like uh, you know diversity, uh, decision-making, as well as inclusion. And this is how we really move from uh, you know uh, understanding each of these capacities in our context up to the way we design our business cases and interventions as well as going into the process of measuring each of them. Now, one other thing that we have also learned critically is that it is uh, impossible to use one or two indicators in order to measure market systems resilience throughout uh, you know, uh, a, a context that we, we, we work in. So for each of these capacities, we come with around one, to or even sometimes three or even more than three indicators in order to get our heads around in order to quantify, uh, you know, the issues that we, we we tend to see for each of the resilience capacity. And to the most part, we use uh, qualitative indicators in order to track how each of these uh, resilience capacities is changing in the context in which we operate. So this is uh, broadly how we actually do it practically in market systems. Uh, rather in, in, in rural resilience activity, right from uh, defining what this, uh, what this resilience capacities are and how we embed it into the various interventions and then how we measure it uh, over the period in which we work. Thank you, Dan, over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, RRA is a good example of a program that very intentionally and, and deliberately applied resources to uh, give a holistic and, and broader look at market systems resilience and then focus on building specific capacities based on that. Next, we're going to hear from Sinbeto about the RIPA program, Resilience in Pastoralist Areas in Ethiopia, which is more organically adapting in response to specific shocks that are hitting key market functions um, for, for households. Um, what what I think is a little interesting is that although this was you know organic and and based on uh, the team's identification of these issues in the market, they still arrived at essentially the same capacities as being really critical to preserve market functionality, uh, connectivity, and market governance. So with that, Sinbeto, I'll turn it over to you. Sorry, I'm seeing a message from Simbeto that the the mute button, um, or he might be unable to mute. I don't know if the Julie, are you able to unmute him? Thanks, Dan. Let's check on that. Um, Jenny.
His mute should be working now. I think if you try it against Inveto, it may work better now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry for technology. So, building on the, my colleagues earlier said, uh, RIPA is um, the pastoral area focus program, and uh, livestock is the main livelihood for the pastoral communities. And the small ruminants, especially goat business, is the key to for the household as well as the market level resilience building for the wider target area. And uh, without understanding, uh, RIPA program started resilience building journey at early stage, just more focus on the, the understanding that building the linkage of the, the, the local level livestock trader will the indie market has potential and consistency and the right connected flow of the animal from the producer level up to the indie market. But now the recurrent shock, that's mainly two major shocks, even though there are a number of shocks affected connectivity of the market access. So the two shocks, the major shock in the Horn of Africa, especially in Ethiopia, is the one in the drought, and this drought shock has significantly affected the, the livestock producer to supply the right quality of animals, and, and also the right volume of animals, and also it's resulted on the disconnectivity again, because the flow is stuck, the end buyer required the animal, and then and the connectivity becoming loose and loose from time to time. The second piece is the, the price fluctuation because the livestock price mainly more more focus on the export market is determined by the end market buyers. There is no good way of market information flows from the producer level back to the, the, the goat aggregator and also on the local livestock traders. And this, um, because of this, the connection created become disconnected frequently because the, the traders lose their money when they bring into the in the market. So, with that um, learning, Repi started facilitating backward and forward linkage with the um, with the introduction of integrated vertical integration and reinforced by the the horizontal integration. Now, one 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 the biggest market facilitation Repi did. It was um, identifying the big livestock buyer from the central market who has the capacity of 100, at least 140,000 animals per annum, and then agreed on um, working on downstream investment to support the growth aggregation businesses to have better capacity to be one to be connected and to be um, uh, trust each other through uh, injecting the capacity building support like um, creating upfront financial service, assigning agencies, and also providing transportation service. The second piece is when, when after that piece, then the second critical focus area is local level capacity building. You know, if there is no good capacity at the, the local aggregator level to feed animals back to the, the big buyer, no good flow. So RIPA again facilitated capacity building at the, the goat aggregator business level that's more mainly located in the pastoral and agro pastoral area that's more focused on also doing the same kind of downstream investment to the the the, the local village level livestock traders with this process or this able to reach um, 115 local livestock um, uh, mini collectors and also build their capacity to work go back to the pastoral agro pastoral level the by, by those that that is not well developed as the other two pieces and also because you know the growth has its own implication on the access and the supply of feed ripa also identified and then supported uh, the the local level uh, feed fodder producer to again to be connected with the both aggregated business whenever they want feed demand to access and at the result, you know, this, this connection facilitation happened, including the, the animal health service delivery that's localized in a wider geographic area. Actually, it's, it's also not only just serve the, the both aggregator business, but also go down up to the producer level. And as a result, because of the even other kind of shocks happening, that is mainly related to drought and the price fluctuation, you know, 
gradually we were able to observe increasing connectivity and the stress between the, the ghost aggregator business and also the central buyer and then also that resulted in the smooth flow of the animal. The second uh, good thing is resulted at this stage is the, the big buyer, which initially mainly focused on only buying the animal, he started investing time, resource, and uh, the different embedded service to both aggregator business, you know, this, this kind is create a kind of mutual relationship uh, between the two actors. And, um, and, and also those um, both aggregator business after they feel a confidence on the, the smooth flow and the smooth connection with the national buyer, they started accessing feed further from the business that the project supported in the local area. So this, this, this kind of the vertical and horizontal linkage and connectivity created, even at the early stage, even though it's not matured, resulted even in a, within a short period of time, more than 90% increase in the sale transaction of animal between the big buyer and the, and the, the regional livestock trader. So, you know, this is evolving, one, one, one piece is evolving again and again, and also connecting one another. You know, this the whole process supported the market actors to be well connected and also gradually helped them to, to improve their market governance internal capacity. So the big learning we had from this process is it's not, not only focusing on the one line vertical integration of the market actor, but also intentionally building the capacity of the market actor, facilitating vertical and horizontal integration had a potential contribution for the market system resilience. This is something we learned at this stage and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mercy Corps team. Um, very interesting yeah, hearing more and more about um, how do we start integrating and thinking about resilience um, at these different programming levels. And, and your examples were really helpful and, and very interesting sort of this intentional programming around resilience for the rural resilience activity in Northeast Nigeria, whereas it's sort of more organic response when you're looking at the resilience and pastoral areas program in Ethiopia. And, you know, interesting kind of these key capacities that you keep on coming back to. There, there was, and um, there were some examples. Robert Omar asked, you know, um, specifically on the Northeast Nigeria program, you know, do you use other quantitative indicators to start beeping up your qualitative indicators? Um, any response from you, um, John, on that? So yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. Okay, thank you, Maggie, and thank you, Robert, for the question. Uh, like I said, there is virtually uh, no single indicator that could help us measure uh, each of the capacities for market systems uh, resilience. And so we kind of blend uh, several uh, indicators in order to, uh, you know, uh, come up with, uh, with something that could uh, help us, uh, you know, understand or get our heads around each of these capacities. For example, uh, yes, whereas I've put uh, several qualitative indicators here, there are also quantitative indicators that uh, tend to uh, help us beef up, uh, you know, our argument for the qualitative indicator. Typical example is where we're looking at a number of uh, players, for example, offering a variety of goods or services as we try to measure diversity. So these are quantitative indicators or number of, uh, you know, uh, business models uh, are uh, being applied by you know uh, several uh, market players in, in a particular place. These are quantitative in indicators that help us to understand uh, our thinking in line with uh, uh, the qualitative indicators as well for each of the resilience capacities. Yeah, but again, at uh, at impact level, we also sometimes look at you know uh, is there a percentage increase in uh, you know in, in productivity? Is there increase in income? Those are still vital indicators that help uh, us see uh, whether these, uh, you know, uh, people are benefiting from uh, the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. We've had some interesting discussion on the chat, and I want to bring some of that into this conversation now. A, a interesting question from Chris Noplanik from USA, and she's kind of challenging our panelists to think a little bit here. She says, you know, it's, it's interesting hearing these cases, but 
what what do you think is one of the most interesting or significant interventions that you took to explicitly because of market systems resilience considerations that you might not have done otherwise i'm not going to ask everyone to share but just um if you if you want to unmute um and just share anyone on the panel something particularly significant that when you looked at your programming you wouldn't have focused on you would have done differently um, that you took on because you were thinking about resilience that you wouldn't if that hadn't been your focus lens. Um, who'd like to share with us first? Just unmute and, and you can share. Okay. Hey, go ahead. Sorry, Hayden, go ahead. Go, sorry, go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, just to share, uh, you know, uh, an example from our our work in uh, in Bangladesh on a livestock program where we have um, the main main thrust of the program has been to work with livestock service providers and um, particularly building up the network of local of, of female livestock service providers that um, are you know creating greater access to female headed households and and female dairy producers and I think um, you know it maybe happen more organically, but uh, recognizing that their cultural norms were almost a um, a, a particular threat to uh, to the to the connectivity of the system in that female service providers could not uh, travel without fear of physical, you know, safety or harassment. And, um, you know, the project has worked to build in um, gender-based violence uh, action planning with not only these service providers, but their suppliers and off-takers in the dairy value chain. So I, I think what's interesting, um, as we were just kind of talking about that case study recently, was, you know, inclusion um, is, a, is a big part of building connectivity and, and creating a more diverse and, and um, you know, resilient market system. But in doing so, um, we often, you know, come up against those social norms that we're trying to shift and that which can then kind of create those shocks or disruptions. Um, and so preparing those um, those market actors and trying to build in systems like a gender based violence um, risk mitigation system into the value chain um, is is necessary. So I, I thought that was somewhat um, novel for us in terms of the first time we we kind of had to do that within a market system um, in terms of our inclusion work. So just one thought on there. I'll turn it over to you, uh, Bernard. Thanks, Aidan. Um, thank you, Kristen, for, for the question. Uh, uh, one, one kind of general comment I would make in relation to urban programming, uh, often the sort of default in urban programming has been sort of area-based programming. Um, and research, thinking differently and applying a sort of market system resilience lens, it, it completely changes the nature and type of engagement in urban programming, that you are focused on a particular territory, but also being very aware of the relevant uh, uh, local systems that are critical for the functioning of, of, that, of that territory or that neighborhood. Um, and an example would be uh, where we found ourselves in a situation where we're supporting networks of, of small businesses negotiate with suppliers to look at risk scenarios for supply chains, basic uh, food supply into neighborhoods. We, we would never have got to that point unless we were thinking about market system resilience. Two great examples there. Any other examples from anyone on the call on the panel? Uh, Maggie, Maggie if, if I may, I can add an, an example of what we are seeing here in Northeast Nigeria. Uh, uh, because of the conflict in Northeast Nigeria, there are some types of fertilizers that uh, government tend to restrict, states government tend to restrict significantly. They don't allow uh, private sector players to bring in some of these fertilizers because if the guns into the hands of uh, extreme groups, they use them as explosive uh, devices. And so uh, because uh, of this kind of restrictions, we kind of found like it was uh, uh, after analyzing and you know trying to quantify the risk and understanding what the issues are, uh, we we began to engage with the business member organizations to uh, begin to uh, work with government to see how uh, you know this regulation could be either removed or at least uh, some window of opportunity could be allowed to the, given to the private sector players to move some of these uh, you know uh, items. So in our 
experience, you know, uh, really uh, strengthening the uh, business member organizations or industry associations, uh, if I may, in order to uh, engage uh, proactively in the advocacy or lobbying, uh, you know, uh, uh, activities, especially in conflict related, um, I mean, conflict affected uh, geographies like Northeast Nigeria has been quite uh, resourceful in, 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 in order to give the window of opportunity of the private sector players to, uh, you know, bring some of these, uh, you know, uh, products that are, are less risky, but also allow the farmers uh, in order to allow the farmers to get uh, high quality commodities that they would use. Uh, let me say this, that uh, whereas there are also all these restrictions, the demand for uh, fertilizers in Northeast Nigeria, for example, that does not go away and there's also no uh, immediate alternative. And so uh, intervening in the space where we work with industry associations to uh, actively engage in uh, lobbying or self-policing or self-regulating uh, to uh, give opportunity for fertilizers to move in Northeast Nigeria has been quite uh, meaningful for us as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I think all really interesting examples of as programming thinks about resilience, how do we how do we start changing? Interesting comment made by Sarah Ward um, talking about um, some of the new ideas that are out from the Overseas Development Institute, ODI's latest research on social safety nets and the re resilience in crisis areas, and the need to start reworking our approach from risk assessment and response to a full acceptance of uncertainty. And it'll be interesting to start seeing how that impacts our work. I, I did want to ask a little bit um, about some of these um, areas where many folks are starting to talk about resilience and how does it relate to the localization agenda? And we know that within donors, especially within, for example, USA, there's a, there's a big push to localization. When we start talking about market systems resilience, there seems to be somewhat of a connection to this localization agenda. Um, could I just ask panelists, I mean, it'd be great to hear from each organization a little bit on how you think resilience and talking about market systems resilience directly connects to this, this area of talking about localization. Who would like to set us off, to start us off? Maybe we could start off with thoughts from thoughts from goal. Yeah, thank you, Margie. Um, yeah, in, in goal, we, we, we firmly believe that the, the only way to move crisis affected populations from crisis towards resilience is to protect, stabilize and, and strengthen local systems. Essentially, a, a crisis is when local systems have collapsed um, and that sort of local collaboration is dependent on, on external support. And, and a key point that, that we would make is that localization is not just about building the capacity of local actors. It's fundamentally about building the capacity of local systems. Uh, and to do that, you need to understand the role of different actors, local actors within those systems and, and build their capacity based on their role within local systems. So that they're, they're fundamentally interlinked. They're two sides of the same coin, resilience and local and localization. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bernard. And I, I really appreciate your focus. I think it's very insightful localization being not only about building capacity of local actors, but of local systems. Um, ACI Voka, thoughts from your side. Thank um, you. Okay, I, I think go ahead, uh, Sue Allen. Yes. Um, thank you, Hayden. Um, I think that uh, some interesting thing about our case is that crisis, we identify crisis at a national level, but also the framework that we develop with the local actors was useful for most focused crisis. For example, when in a destination it's happening uh, social unrest or something locally or uh, something has to do with the state of the, the beaches, for instance. Um, and the framework works at, at this local level because uh, sometimes even if external help or uh, help from the government is in place, it will not be deployed immediately as a response because things are happening at the local level. So the, the market actors there and the stakeholders are going to be the first ones to realize what is happening and they have to have um, 
a, a response, a framework developed so they can have a timely and quick response, especially uh, since tourism is very uh, vulnerable to news and media and, and all those things. So I think that was an important lesson that we learned, uh, the fact that uh, we had to work at a local level with local organizations and had them be the ones that since they are going to be the ones that realize first about the crisis, be the ones to have that first response and be empowered. Thank you. And thank you, Sue. You know, I think that as Robert Omar said in the chat, you know, I think it's important that we recognize when we talk about the localization agenda, we're, we're not talking about only working in, in local systems. We're working, we recognize the system is is looking at global systems and um, and how things interreact. I mean, he speaks about, you know, we can look at the regional level or the national or international level. But what we're talking about with localization is how are we empowering the local system and the local organization to be able to do this themselves rather than having development interventions coming in kind of from the outside and, and doing the space. Um, any other comments from the panel? Uh, Hayden, you were going to speak. I don't know if Sue Allen's covered what you were going to contribute. Um, no, I mean, I, I would just like reinforce the fact that, you know, we in the middle of a crisis we're facing right now with uh, fertilizer prices, you know, in Africa and uh, energy crisis in, in Europe, like there's, there's a immediate kind of feeling of we need to respond now as development actors on the ground. We need to have an immediate response that shows our donors we are solve, you know, we are helping resolve or mitigate the problems. And I think that that pressure, uh, that coupled with uh, the localization pressure too, that's coming from our, you know, a lot of our donors. Um, maybe we're we're either putting, we're thinking about lo localization and response in crisis. Maybe not in that more thoughtful way of where where, where it should be about working through through local systems. And so I think, like, uh, as opposed to to just quickly putting out solutions to uh, you know, uh, address uh, high input costs that were, were, were taking the needed time to work through those local systems to come up with solutions, um, identify alternative sources, identify ways to create more efficiencies in, in the distribution channels, um, and be a, a convening power, be a, uh, an analytical power to help make those decisions, um, you know, better for for local systems and and not be the not be an external sort of um actor in the you know in the middle of the market system so yeah i just uh i think of all things that came out from this uh webinar for me it was was the local system strengthening is is just critical to effective msr I really like thank that. you and and it's interesting um you know i think a, a good recognition from sarah ward is uh, which who says on the chat you know they, when you're working in conflict areas and with conflict actors and you depend on local systems, there might be other types of risks involved. I mean, where and how do you assure access and being seen as a good actor and sort of the dangers of, of who you're working with in different ways. But thoughts from the, the Mercy Corps side over to you on this area of localization. Yeah, jumping quickly. Um, I think um, localization is well recognized from our end and also if you see the, I'll not go back, we said on the RIPA program, but one of the, the, the focus area of RIPA program is uh, building the local uh, institutions, market actors capacity to respond for the different shock and distress, the disaster risk management and response capacity. You know, if the local actor has no good understanding or early warning information, and then also analyzing the early market, I mean, early warning information and also disseminating that information, livestock producer no longer will be productive in the given area. So even not only that, it's also even the financial institution in the local area. You know, this producer, which I listed earlier, both the local level, mini collector, cost aggregated largely depend on the localized financial institutions. So, and then the merge core is intentionally working in building the financial institutional capacities based on the local area, microfinance institutional, mobile money transfer system and those, those all are important pieces and also this, there are a number of critical pieces um, Mercy Corps as well as RIPA program is trying to connect including even 
not only businesses and also not only government, but also local level NGOs who are working at the ground level to be better capacitated and then respond for the critical shocks. You know, they are the ones who are on the ground level and also support the, the wider community working. Thank you. Thank you, Sinbeto. Uh, Gabriella, over to you. Yes, yes. Um, I would like to add to all this discussion that that is why we, we need to understand local local actors' capacities um, at the same time of vulnerabilities. But if we talk about resilience, we need to understand capacities and also available assets. So leveraging these available assets and capacities to make system work better for um, everyone, but especially for crises affected populations. And I think this is a, a, th a good starting point to avoid doing harm, you know? So at, at least this is what we are um, learning in this uh, different um, programs in fragile and conflict affected context. Thank you. Um, Dan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Margie. And I, I wanted to, to also toss in the example of RRA, I hope John doesn't mind my my speaking for his program uh, for Mercy Corps. But I think there's been an interesting example in response to the very um, severe impact of COVID, along with government lockdowns and and displacement in Northeast Nigeria, which severely impacted the economy, severely impacted households' ability um, to maintain their livelihoods and to maintain even food supply, um, which did lead to uh, what what Mercy Corps and USAID felt was a very necessary um, large scale cash transfer. I believe it was about $15 million in funds were, were transferred, but using um, the market systems resilience lens and Mercy Corps markets and crisis framework, this wasn't given as a more direct disruptive transfer, but it was combined with all of the building of um, local market capacity. So, as John referenced earlier, building uh, the decision making capabilities of local market actors, um, their ability to understand, you know, the shocks, stresses that affected them, as well as opportunities available, building market governance, um, which led to this very positive and, and mutually reinforcing uh, sort of market systems development approach at the, the market actor level together with the large cash transfers which jump started the local economy and were and, and allowed households to continue engaging as both suppliers and producers within the, the market system. Um, so I think it was a good example of still, you know, this relatively large external intervention, but that was layered in with the building of local capacities, allowing for uh, less disruption and, and more positive reinforcement. Thank you, Dan. And, you know, I think interesting um, and important comment in the in the chat made by um, Dan Grover um, uh, saying good point that market systems resilience is about shifting how risk is managed in systems away from systems where the risks are shouldered by individual households, especially the most vulnerable, to where risk gets managed at higher levels of the system, whether in communities and supply chain sectors or supply chains, other sectors, societies, or even regionally or internationally. So, so getting support from, from outside. And I think that is really kind of a, a really important point in, in bringing together a lot of the conversation uh, that we've had today. So. In closing, I'd like to ask um, our panelists today, and also please do feel free to share any thoughts from anyone who is uh, listening in on this conversation in the chat. Um, thoughts on if you were to walk, if you were to talk to someone about sort of a really important piece that you want to share around thinking about market systems resilience. You know, what do you want people to walk away with? What is the the key piece, whether it's thinking about how markets function or what our programming can do um, or how we want to think about this going forward. You know, what is a word of sort of something that you personally find an important or interesting, um, uh, I suppose, um, guideline or piece of information or story to think about in terms of market systems resilience. So I've left it quite wide, but um, I just want to ask panelists if you want to think about those. Um, and just uh, raise your hand when you're ready to share. And also feel free to share some of your thoughts. You know, what is kind of a, 
key takeaway point for you in terms of thinking about um, uh, market systems resilience. And I can read some things out from the, the chat too. So um, who would like to take just you know, a quick few seconds, something that you're walking away with, you want people to remember. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm really thinking, when, when I think about what I'm walking away with uh, from today, something that really resonates with me is actually something that, that you know, Bernard, you spoke about in terms of, um, you know, thinking about market, um, when we talk about, you know, the localization agenda and thinking about localization being about building the capacity of not just local market actors, but, but local systems um, uh, is something that stood out for me. But Hayden, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think a quick uh, learning to share from us on the analytical side has been, um, you know, the, the USA um, uh, market systems resilience framework has been really helpful in terms of using that as a lens to think about um, how can our market systems change objectives um, be viewed through this resilience framework. But I, I'd say at the same time to not, um, we've, we've tried not to get too hung up on on covering all of those domains and trying to come up with measurements around those. Um, we um, are, are sort of taking an approach of let's identify those factors that uh, contribute to important changes um, that we think are, you know, relevant to market systems resilience and, and really just focus on those and, and be free to come up with our, those indicators um, that we want to use to measure. And, and there's a lot of great indicators in that, um, that resilience uh, resource guide a market systems resilience resource guide, and but also obviously allowing flexibility to come up with um, others that make sense. So I think it's really about customizing how you analyze and um, and set uh, targets for market systems resilience uh, based on your knowledge of the global context. Thank you, thank you, Hayden. Um, anyone else from the panel something to share as a closing thought? Bernard, go ahead. I think I think one of the kind of key takeaways that I think is emerging from this discussion, other discussions, is that, that there is a need for a shift in thinking on localization. Uh, I think we're touching on on a really important point, and and localization isn't just important for humanitarian interventions; it's for all types of interventions to to achieve positive social impact, whether it's in a humanitarian crisis or a development context. Another kind of key message that we would like to communicate is that this thinking of uh, market system resilience doesn't just apply to commercial market systems. Mm -hmm. It applies to a whole range of uh, local systems that deliver goods and services to, uh, to communities. Um, and I, I do think that uh, we are going in the right direction. It's hugely challenging. Um, for each organization, it's very challenging. I believe, uh, you know, we need to be careful not to oversimplify this. There's, there's new learning sort of coming through, and the more that we can can share that, uh, you know, maybe in future opportunities, we could talk about the challenges of applying this in a fragile context. Uh, there was comments there around how how do you do this in a sort of conflict zone, and how do you be a trusted actor? There's learning sort of emerging on on that as well. So there's a lot more to share on this journey, but we're definitely going in the right direction, I believe. Excellent. And, and a closing comment from Chris Noplanik from USAID in the chat too, talking about, you know, the focus is maybe, maybe we focus too much on using profit as kind of the market incentive for behavior change. And maybe that's no longer, you know, it's insufficient and it's unsustainable. And we, um, we need to look at, you know, the market incentives of profit maximization, but balancing that with risk mitigation. Um, uh, Gabriella, closing thought from your side. Yeah, I think my key takeaway uh, would be that, yes, we need to understand. I mean, I will accept uncertainty, but informed by risks, by, by the context, so I can be better prepared for, for that uncertain future. And this is highly relevant in fragile and conflict affected context. If we, if we are aware of that, I think we will choose the right interventions and support to be given if it's even if it's stabilizing or strengthening local systems. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And a closing thought from you, Dan. Thank you, Margie. Um, two, two brief thoughts. I think first echoing Hayden's point that 
the market systems resilience framework or increasingly each organization's adaptation of the framework um, can feel a little overwhelming at times when you step back and look at them. And I think just really encouraging teams or programs to, to take it up and not feel obligated to adopt all of it, uh, but really kind of use whatever level and level of resourcing works in, in a given context. And then second of all, I'm also really excited over the next few years to see what we are actually learning about, you know, specific interventions and capacities contribution to market systems resilience. Over. Thank you. And thank you for that, Dan. I think this conversation that we're having today regarding looking at sort of market systems resilience, but particularly in fragile and conflict context is, is really critical and so much more uh, to be done in this area. I think the conversation in a few years will, will be much further down the line, but I, I really think that where we've come so far, not only in market systems thinking, but now thinking about market systems resilience and also in fragile and conflict context is really critical, especially in our world today. So with that, thank you to everyone who is on the session, who's been contributing actively in the chat, and thank you very much to our panelists to bring so much experience and expertise into this space. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>